now we can start. Okay, my name is Tony. I work for Reverb, and I'm going to talk about Swagger, which is a description format for REST APIs. And I'm going to talk three different ways that you can develop faster with it and take advantage of Scala in the meantime. So let me first give an explanation of what uh, Swagger is for. Um, this is specifically why, like I used to have to maintain our APIs, the both the APIs and the documentation themselves. And I had to use uh, WordPress to mark them up, which is just totally lame. <laughs> and the process of doing that <clears throat> meant things like this. Edit, 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 right? So what inevitably happens, and we've all done this, is that you code faster than you document. And that would mean that the documentation would fall behind the actual API, and that people would get unhappy when they couldn't figure out what the heck it was trying to do. So we created Swagger. And um, what it solves is uh, the following things here. Uh, uh, that, that the problem of documentation of, of REST API is that the server code is always ahead of the docs, and that the community was typically the ones correcting us, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, that people, to understand what REST APIs expose, typically do so via trial and error. So you would make a request, you'd get a response, you'd assume that certain uh, attributes in the, in the JSON response were always going to be there, then that they actually aren't sometimes, right? Um, so there's the whole understanding of how to communicate with an API is kind of ghetto. Right? The next thing is that um, API clients, so we would have to handcraft every client that we wanted to talk to an API. So let's say we had a, um, a special API we make for uh, a uh, partner, and I'd have to go create a new Scala client for them, or a new Objective-C, or a new JavaScript client, every time I add something new. Um, and sometimes those clients uh, across different languages would be feature mismatch, so we would update the Python library, but not the Ruby one, and then the Ruby guys would be all upset. They're always upset, but they were upset. <laughs> um, driving, test driving our API was hard, so you'd have to write code to try it out. And then test coverage, so knowing what to actually test against it would, was difficult. All right, so those are the reasons. I won't go into too much more. Um, and does anyone here use Swagger? Has anyone tried Swagger? Some people could. So what it is is a specification which is just a JSON representation of the REST API. Not to be confused for the fact that there's a framework that helps generate that automatically. And it's all open source and powers a lot of different APIs, including some that I'll, I'll demonstrate in just a minute. Okay. So just to make it super clear, and this is a confusion because people think Swagger, they think of the user interface, they think of the, the <coughs> server implementation. Um, but it is simply a uh, JSON spec for a and that's it. And if you produce the JSON spec, then you can be Swagger compliant, then you can take advantage of the, the tool set that has evolved around this. So it looks very simple like this. I'll go into more details in a minute if this monitor continues to work. And once you have that specification produced, whether it's on your server that actually serves the APIs or not, then you can take advantage of things like uh, sandbox user interface for trying out the API. A code generator, which I'll walk through, which is extremely powerful for creating clients and doing other magical things. And then a JavaScript client, which I'm not counting as a code generator because it's dynamic, and I'll demonstrate that as well. Um, and in the process of, uh, of creating the framework for Swagger, we um, our goal of making a server integration is that, like I said, the specification that JSON actually follows the code. Everything is in sync. And if it's integrated, you can take advantage of access-based filtering, which means if there's super magical APIs that only your admins should see with their API keys or their authentication, then they'll be documented. And if they don't have permission, then they'll see it maybe with the public gets to see. And um, currently, Swagger on the server side is, is supported in nine languages and 18 frameworks. We support two of those. Um, but the other point that, that I want to make is that because it's just JSON, it doesn't really matter um, where it's hosted. So for instance, there's a company, uh, MuleSoft, which has a community called API Hub, and they just go write Swagger specs for all kinds of you know, big, famous public APIs, like this is the Box API, the Facebook graph, that sort of thing. And it doesn't really matter that they don't host it. They're just going and describing it. 
Now, that, of course, it's tedious to go and reverse engineer or read the documentation, and they're trapped in that same cycle of how do you know what to call and what are the responses and that sort of thing. But it doesn't get in the way of the deployment of your, of your actual production system, which is something that's helped us get a lot of enterprise adoption. People don't want to touch the, the actual API server that's running at you know, big company A. So they actually host the documentation offline <coughs> the servers, and then they can make calls to it. And once you've produced the, um, the JSON to describe an API, then you can take advantage of this, this code generator that we've built that uses um, uh, mustache templates, and it will simply read the server's description and run it through a Scala-based code generator and then write out in different languages. So at the top right, this is the same code. The same API description is generated as Scala case classes. Below it is Java. Below that is .NET. So if you produce an API and you don't want to have the hassle of learning all of the different languages that your clients need to talk to, then, then you can use something like the code generator to produce these in, in the native dialect. And because it's it's mustache, pretty much anyone can write templates and modify them to, to suit what your business actually needs. And that's a really powerful <laughs> tool that I'll show in a second. Okay, so that's it for my quasi-PowerPoint here. Um, what I want to do is walk you through um, what this actually looks like to use. So. Uh, some people who were in here earlier, um, Ivan Carrero gave a demonstration of Scalatra. And Scalatra is a, a micro framework for REST, or it's a micro web framework. And uh, at Reverb, we use it pretty much exclusively now. And what I'm going to do is show you what the integration looks like for Scalatra and Swagger. So, so in this case here, um, this is a, a simple API that is um, producing a couple of different uh, operations. Um, the, the, if you're not familiar, this is the Scalatra DSL for, for uh, representing a GET request. It uses Ruby top style syntax for saying that pet ID is an actual path parameter that's being passed in. And API operation is, is a um, is a mechanism that Scalatra uses to describe what the actual API is going to produce. And this is effectively all that is needed to produce a Swagger spec. So here this tells me that it's going to return an uh, object of type pet, and it's going to use a nickname, which I'll show more what that means in a minute, called get pet by ID. It's going to produce in the JSON a, a summary value for this operation, which is called find pet by ID, and there are some notes. In addition, this takes a path param of type string called pet ID, which you see matches here. And <coughs> the path parameter has a description called ID of the pet that needs to be fetched. Mm -hmm. right. And in here, it's going to then operate and receive the request. It's going to extract the pet ID, and it's going to call this code and return pet. Or it's going to say invalid pet. Okay. So, what does that look like actually is it in, in operation? Please don't look So now what's happening is Scalatra is firing up the uh, embedded jetty. It's going to compile that code. Done. It's going to start jetty on board. I'm sorry, I have to hide the window light. Okay, so what happened is um, I get the same called a resource listing, which is at the top level. And the resource listing has links to um, API declarations. So if I go to pet, I now have this JSON representation of that API itself. 
So Scalatra has gone and built this out based on this DSL. Let me see if I go and change this. And reload. It looks like a strange mix of YAML and JSON that possessions a lot of elements. In the, um, in the JSON here? Yeah. Oh, that's just my, my <coughs> JSON plugin. Ah. It's, it's, it's showing you. <coughs> yeah, right. this is just a oh, okay. So, you know, as we would see, as we would hope for, at the God way. So, so that is just the dynamic updating. So the nice thing now, now that I have, <coughs> I have this being represented dynamically, and it's loaded from my actual server code, um, I can use the Swagger UI, which I have to shrink a bit here, and point it to <coughs> this URL. Notice I'm running this off the file system, doesn't mind. And now I have a full interactive console for calling that API. Okay, let's look at this a little bit more. Oh, it's just so small I can't even see. Okay, that's fine. So what you see here is this is the that uh, method that we just we were just looking at in Scalatra in the source code, find pet by ID. It's giving me only one option for response content type. I'll explain that in a minute. It says that the response class is going to look something like this. Um, that there's a name, which is a string, tags. There's an array of objects of ID and string. There's a name inside that. And if I execute this with the blood, then I should get the response back from the API in the console. Right? So that's super powerful. The, the idea now that I can just go and write code I can get really clever about how these API operations and parameters are built in the Scala part. Here's a post operation, right? The same thing happens. And, um, and a put operation. They all get described directly in this user interface. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Does it work the same with the play uh, root? It's <coughs> similar to play. There's a play integration as well. Okay, so it, is, it, would, it would play the same Yeah, the play the routes is a little bit um, more decoupled. Like right here in the, in the Scalatra, you edit one file and it kind of takes care of everything. Play has the actual API controller and then a route file that you have to do a little bit of wiring up. I can explain in a minute. Any other questions on this? I don't know the response content type. Good question. Okay. So that was actually declared here as an object of type pet. And this, the Swagger code um, <coughs> will introspect that object, and let's see what that actually looks like. <coughs> this is what a pet looks like. It just goes and introspects all of the fields inside <coughs> here. And for instance, you see this one has a <coughs> complex uh, type of uh, tags, which is a list of, uh, a so list of tags. That. That's right. So if I look at the actual JSON, which is a better way of looking at it on this <coughs> screen, then I see here, pet has these properties. It has tags, which is a type array with items of ref tag. This is a JSON schema style response. And then tag is then expanded right above here. So it, it keeps one level deep hierarchy for expanding any type of object. On the UI, you can see the same thing if you look at the model itself. Here it has a pet object with an array of tags and then it expands the pet object. Okay, so we can do this for lots of different APIs. Um, people have found some interesting uh, ways of describing their API. One other thing I think that's really important to mention is that Swagger, <coughs> while these are gets, puts, posts, delete, it's trying to take that away from the developer and that you just kind of don't need to know a whole bunch about what the HTTP method is and, and what's a path param, what's a header param, what's a put param. Because 
in here, this here is a body, right? That's going to put a body of type JSON, which I can make really easy by tapping on it. But sometimes there are op options such as this. So our developer site. <coughs> where some objects or some um, parameters are being sent that are headers, right? So this is an actual header that gets sent. Skip and limit. You shouldn't necessarily need to know that you have to pass something as a header, as a path parameter, a query parameter. They're just options that get sent into the HTTP request. So one of the goals of Swagger is to say, like, you can have a very RESTful syntax. You can have the not very RESTful syntax. However you build it, as long as it can be described with these parameters that change and people understand it, then we should be able to operate against it. You shouldn't get in trouble because you have a post that you're operating on as a delete in your in your actual API code. You shouldn't get your hands slapped with that. If the user just says, oh, I want to delete a, a pet, for instance, and whether it's a put or a delete or whatever it is, HTTP-wise, it should just work. But it actually does expose the header so it's, it's like accept language or something like that. That's right. So you can, you can, for, you can, for instance, say that like I need to pass a um, API key as a as a request header, and then it will just pass it through. Because as long as it's described, it doesn't really matter. So we look at some of these other um, people who are integrating with it. Um, what's an interesting? Oh, U.S. government. Very interesting. Um, right. So the nice thing here is that like. I just don't need to know a whole bunch about how this stuff works, right? I can just try out the API. I don't know what this is going to return. Contacts, tree. They have a new slow account. Is there any on the same office then? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the prism. Right. The API. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, this is, star. I don't know that they have it integrated with their server. I, I look at the headers. Uh, let's see what the response headers. I think they strip out the response headers, so I don't know. What kind of server this is, but no info, right? So you know they might not be integrating with this. One. This might be running PHP. It might be Node.js. Like we don't, we don't really know. Someone has just gone and described this, and now people can take advantage of it. Okay. So let's talk about um, like what you can do once you know once you know what the description looks like. Um, is there any functionality that might integrate this with like buzzing or, or test suite to basically? I mean, I guess you're it's generating documentation based on your code, so I guess right. it kind of is self-enforcing. Yeah, because you can um, you can generate um, test suites if you want because you know all the methods and all the operations. You can jigger the values and try passing in something that's not required, is required, or vice versa. That's what so uh, is this always to be used with Scala as the server code? No, in fact, I know this is blasphemous to say here, but most people don't use Scala as an agreement server. So the, the biggest audience is Java, but there's a big audience of people in Rails and Node.js that are integrated with the server. Do they have to write Scala code to define the schema? No. no. So the schema can be described a bunch of different ways. Let me actually walk through that and I'll show you I'll show you what, what I'm talking about. So remembering that remembering that the whole idea here is that you just have to describe your API as JSON, right? I can go and do whatever I want in JSON and describe it, and as long as some web server is serving this up, then I should be able to access it with the, um, the Swagger UI. So let's do that here. This is a uh, handcrafted um, uh, Swagger spec. I'm going to just launch Jetty to serve those up. So in this case here, all I need is for these things to be served up. 
So if I look now on my local Jetty web server, so now it's just serving up that JSON again. You, know, you can change, do whatever you want in here, right? Like it's just, it's just a flat file. Um, This is the resource listing, and this is the API version here. So it doesn't matter what generates this JSON. If it's Scala code, then that's great. Everyone likes that. If it's Node or Ruby or some person coding this stuff in my hand, then that's another option. Right? So it, to answer your question, you don't need a Scala-based server to produce JSON. The nice thing, though, is that once I have something representing the API, I can now um, generate clients against it. So in here, I have a, uh, I'm going to use a Scala code gen. Oops. So I'm going to use a code generator, which is going to read, it's just going to read this JSON. And it's going to generate me a scholar file. Now this is simple because all that has to happen is something has to understand the description of your API, just like just like an interface in in the, old, in the Java world, right? So once I understand that API, then I should be able to code a client to talk to it. So let's look at what I just did. So it just wrote this code. And the reason why it knows how to write this code is it just introspected and read the JSON and put it in, in a structure that the, that's a mustache template that's going to express. And from that, I wrote this all out. So here, it's reading this base path, which is where the API lives. You can see from the, actually, yeah, this is a direct mapping here. And it's going to go over each of the API operations that it sees, such as add and meet up here. Is this going to go and write the client code to do that? So think of how much work this is when you have a really complicated API. You know, this is a simple one, there's only a couple lines in it. But um, once you have the ability to generate the clients, then you should be able to very easily um, support a large number of languages without having teams dedicated to understanding. So that simple JSON described enough for me to generate this UI and likewise to generate this scholar file. Right. What are the other languages can you use? So, so we, we have template support for, this is my favorite here because no one likes writing objectives. <laughs> um, we have support for Scala in an async fashion, so using like everything is in futurism, we have a more traditional blocking type of Scala implementation. There's Java, Python, um, PHP, Ruby, JavaScript, Objective-C, ActionScript, yeah, right. so .NET, people, yeah, people, people still use it. It's called Swagger Spec? It's called uh, Swagger Code Engine. Okay. So now here, if I look at what was just generated from the Objective-C code, Okay. All that garbage that you just really don't want to write on hand. Right? And the implementation. And all the models. This is actually a lot of Haskell to you. This is not a new concept. Like, we did not invent this concept. Like, if you used Wizzle or Wizzle of Java and that stuff a long time ago, it's, it's very similar. But there's one. <coughs> yeah, but let me put what I think the most important difference is, um, is this, right? I don't have to write the code to generate that, right? This is just a mustache template, and it's using Scala as a templating engine. 
Um, I know people have ripped out Scala because they think it's too slow and replaced it with J mustache and that's all fine. But the idea is anyone can pretty much write a client in their own dialect, their own style. Someone wrote a closure, closure code generator, right? I don't know any closure. Um, Pascal even. Because if there's enough uh, richness in the understanding of the calls to write objective C, then you can write it. So for what's really need to respect white space, so I assume the stuff should respect white space and depend on the Yeah, it's kind of and everything. It's really weird. I don't actually know all the rules for how it deals with indents and that sort of thing. It's, there's a little bit of art in getting it all to look good. And you see some of it doesn't look good in, in, in our generating. Any questions on this so far? <coughs> yes. A uh, question about generating this with the, uh, so I love the API out there. Front end guys are loving this. But it, uh, the code you have to add to Scalatra seems a little intrusive. Yes. Is there a way to hide that a little later? Mm -hmm. That Scalatra guy just ran out of here. Yeah, <laughs> so you have to take it. Yeah, I got to take this one. Well, there's a couple of different ways. So let me talk through some patterns in here. Okay? Cool. So looking at, um, at this Scala Squadra server. Okay. This is actually something that he did that's very clever, right? So if you think back to, did anyone here use Jersey? Jax RS in Jersey? Like everyone's used that, right? Where the methods, uh, arguments in the method turn into arguments for your REST request. You annotate them, say it's a path param, it's a header param, or it's something else, some body param, it's special. Um, Squadra is not as painful. Kind of takes in, it consumes the servlet and the servlet request in it, and it gets to do something with it. So in this case here, this operation, like if I take this piece of code out, I mean, that's all that Scotch really needs. You don't define necessarily; it's not bound to those parameters as inputs. So we have to explicitly tell them. We do the same thing with play as well, with play two integration. So what we've done to to make this easier is. Um, is usually on the parameter side. We will we will describe a parameter that's really common, like it's uh, skip and limit, right? Skip and limit is used across like every one of our, of our operations. So we'll just we'll define something called equals. Um, I think it's a query param. So you basically define the whole skip parameter and then add it to this list of in the um, in the in the the Scalatra definition, so I just say here skip. Right. So that that's the pattern that we followed. Is if you have sometimes standard parameters, and you just kind of I don't want to say mix them in, but you add them in this builder style fashion to to the operation itself. That's been the, the easiest way. Um, I'll show you what it looks like in Jax RS, which is a little bit tighter bond, there's some tighter binding to, to how those um, the parameters would match to the um, wider spectrum. Actually, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Any other questions? So, now, now that you've sort of extracted out the API, do you think that maybe REST isn't the right or the wire protocol for this? Uh, I think that there's a lot of ways that you can transition to better protocols by having a description of the API. Okay. I, and I guess it's also like, do you ever think maybe maybe we should just use SOAP from the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> Can we use, say, SOAP-like? No, I think SOAP is just, it, if you actually go back, it, like I'm pretty old, so I know some of this, I remember some things like Corba and stuff like that for communicating among servers. Did I just offend someone? <laughs> okay. Um, one of the problems is that a spec like this, like if you try to solve all problems, then you get something like Corva, right? You get something that doesn't really make anyone happy. And so Swagger is trying to keep a very tight and simple way to describe the, the interfaces, right? Now, SOAP got just bloated, right? And most people, well, this could be bloated in two years. It so. could be, right? And so that's why it's being promoted by someone who has no commercial interest in it. So we don't have to answer to um, big company Y wants us to add 
actually a very big database company that's up here asked us to add soap <laughs> support. Asked us to add soap support for this. I'm like, we're not gonna. No, we're not going to add soap support. It's, it's going to just turn into a piece of junk, right? So I think as long as it's independent and fairly pragmatic, then, then it won't turn into soap-free or wisdom for it. It's, it, it. There's always that risk, right? Okay. Yeah. So we had this interesting thing. We basically uh, first wrote a JSON by hand, put it on an Nginx, and then let front-end guys play with this, and we decided to pull back contract. Front-end guys will look at the back-end guys, right? Mm -hmm. We have to start with JSON, right? Not produce from the server. And going from there, we will develop uh, the endpoint. And yep. that what happened, they took it, and they keep the redundancy model definition. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to run Nginx, they run Grunt. So they actually redesi re redefined the, the JavaScript class, mm -hmm. and they factor out all the models into their own little JavaScript thing, mm -hmm. and then they include it, and it produces the model. So so how crucial is it to produce the final JSON with all of the models repeated? Do we really need to, is that the definition? Do we need to, can we accept like a sub JavaScript uh, format that will generate all the JSON? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah. so the question is, uh, is, is, isn't generating JavaScript descriptions a drag? I think that's what you're getting at, right? Yeah. JSON, oh, I'm sorry, JSON descriptions a drag. And I think it is. I think that machines do a better job of generating JSON than people, right? And so there's a bunch of different folks who have just been writing little markdown DSLs to convert it to write this. And then who cares if it's redundant to that point, right? So write it in markdown. There's a spec called Blueprint, which is called Apiary, which is a pretty nice markdown syntax for describing APIs. So just turn it into JSON. Anyone can turn machine generate JSON. That's, that's why I think the right answer is. But this is writing this by hand is drag. But if you include, if you have to basically repeat the models in the current spec, you're introducing an error. And for instance, YAML, YAML can include other YAML. So if you would use YAML instead of JSON, you have a standard way to include one YAML instead of the other YAML. Yeah, right. So that's uh, like, can you can include models in some way, just not to repeat them? Yeah. So I, I don't, uh, I, I don't. The, what you're getting at is if if I have another API, like let's say it's, um, let's look at the pet store. So the tag in the other model, right? That's right. So if I look at the pet here, now there's a tag, right? There's all this stuff, and it repeats. There's a pet here, and if I go to another description, I think that it might be in here as well. So to me, I, I would prefer that it's that there's more duplicity in across these different JSON descriptions than compactness that can cause confusion. So I, I don't mind that it repeat, like order might be in here and in another API. It's just tedious if you manually generate it, which I think that there's a lot of work around. Okay. Okay. So, so let's look at some, something else that um, you can do with this, and Alexi hinted at it. So if you if you sit down and let's say that you've got a new product that you're going to put out and you've got to describe this API and you have a consumer that's going to be Objective-C and you know you've got to write the server, then my, my suggestion is you should start by writing specs instead of writing code. And by writing specs, you can sit down with the person who's going to consume it and agree on what that contract looks like. So if I know that these are the methods I'm going to get, and we do this actually at Reverb where we look at the models and the operations, the front end guy looks at it, before the back end guy goes and codes it. Right? This is a great way to kind of uh, look at it, an overview of your API. Now, using the, the code gen, and notice how it's not called client generator, it's code generator, I can actually just make a different set of templates that read that JSON and write out a server. So, the idea is, if there's enough information, and this kind of makes you start, this is a little chicken and egg-ish, but if there's enough information to, to describe your API in, in JSON, then there's also enough information to write your API. So what I just did is I ran another, um, another set of templates over and read that spec, and it just generated Right. 
looks a lot like the other one, right? But just because we have all the information about the API, I could just go and generate the stuff server. And I think it actually works. Now, you could say, well, okay, so you're gonna do this once and then someone's gonna make a change and it's gonna blast over your code and then everyone's gonna be pissed off. Um, that could happen, right? The, the right thing to do Uh, in my my opinion, is to have the template actually um, use partial or, or extended trait or something like that. That's the easy stuff, right? Saying that saying that this is my API class, I can have it also write out um, calling something called a meetup service. Right? This is my job to implement, right? The code generator can't generate your business logic, not yet, but but it can do this. And the nice thing about calling another tier like this as a service, or mixing it in as a trade, is that if the signature changes on the API, it's going to break here. It's going to give me a compiler error. If I add another another operation, or another parameter here to, to um, fetching meetups, I want this thing to break. I want the compiler to tell me, hey, there's an extra parameter in here. Someone's adding uh, is in the future, or some other parameter, right? This is all generated automatically. And the server war runs. It's my life works. So this all got generated from that case number. What that means then is that the server guy can now go off and do this thing. The client guy, we can generate the client for the client uh, consumer. They can go off and do their thing. Server guy can go through this implementation and stuff actually can be meshed together. And that's what you get from an interface or a description of your API. Does that make sense? Okay. Some other things you can do. Um, Concurrently, you can only generate the server itself. No. Jo here's a Java one. Um, and this is just using Java and JAX RS. Is there an easy way to add a multiple versions for your API. So if you have like API v1 and then you move on to API v2, you still want to support your API v1. Is there an easy way to do that if you have like overlaps and not re uh, generating? Oh, versioning is hard. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had the, 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 the magic bullet on that. Uh, I think that there's, um, there's just different techniques and I don't think anyone has really settled on what the best one is. Um, this is the job of it. See the indentation Yeah, I, 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 what we do is we, we, we have separate servers actually to support V1 and V2, and then our load balancer will route based on what the, what the path is. Does that make sense? So, okay, so that's that's um, the Java version. And then here's a Node.js version. It's not hard, right? It's just writing mustache templates and you can have a s certain type of server that's not supported, you can write your own templates. Uh, there's different style that you use. There's no So far, and there is no problem right now. Yeah. Um, I'll show one last thing, and then and then I'll will stop for other questions. Okay. So so now the, good. This is a great note down. Okay. So um, as I mentioned on one of the slides, JavaScript is a different. It's different from our code generator because it's tiny. Let me show you what that looks like. Now, we have a JavaScript library that runs both in Node or in the browser, and it's the exact same library. It uses a HTTP library called Shred instead of Java jQuery. Um, we have the right bar whenever you work in JavaScript, which always feels weird.
did is I just started I started a node REPL and I required this client library that we produce this smarter client. And then I pointed it to an API description and told it to build. And what it does is it reads the description and reflects upon itself and builds up all the functions that it needs to. So now if I need to call that um, So now, by just reading that description, I have all of the functions that were available from that API. So I see find meetups was one of the, the methods that I described in the API. Well, let's say I don't know what it actually, I don't know how to call find meetups. So I can just say dot help. And it just goes and tells me uh, in a sort of fashion, the title, the title of the meetup to search for, tag, the tag, active search for active meetups only. So now I can just call this thing. that has, you know, most APIs have some sort of credential system. Yeah, good question. So um, for this particular use case we're talking about? Uh, well, or in this general. and in general. Okay, let's talk about um, like various ways of signing the request and yeah. stuff like that. So this, this is an example here how in the description for the API, it tells you how to make the OAuth 2 request. So it says what the, uh, the grant types are. In this case, it does uh, auth code and implicit is an error token. It tells you what, what you need to call in order to make the request, and then what the token is named. So typically, people hard code, like if Facebook, then use this. If, you know, if Twitter, then use this. So the idea is that you can describe the authorization scheme here. And then from that, this also has a API key type that is required to populate So from that, then, there's enough description to programmatically code your client how to populate it. And once you get to OAuth 1 and the 5 million different variants of it, then it's a lot trickier because some of them require signing, some of them don't. There's, there's no real standard. OAuth 2 is pretty easy. But that's the mechanism that's, that's built there for people to express the authentication scheme and then like we're playing the law two client support, but other people are going to have to. The community will have to write the same law. So you can write like custom ones. That's right. right. And even from the like the JavaScript console, like I can just 
I can add I'm not going to do it, but I can add authorization schemes that get injected into the request. Other questions? Yes. Or um, so you showed the dynamic, uh, not really code generation, but whatever you want to call it, discovery mm -hmm. thing. JavaScript is there any other languages that support that? Like it could be it seems like it would make it, sense. It, it should, but we don't have one. Okay. okay. The rest of the, the clients, uh, client generators are um, are all scattered. This is the repo. One other thing that you can do when you have all of this description, which is pretty handy, not everyone wants uh, not everyone wants dynamic try now documentation. So probably the simplest use case for for the Swagger code generator is to write um, static static documentation. This is this is um, generated from the code gen as well. Right? So it's the simplest the simplest use case is actually to say, okay, well, let's generate a set of static documentation. So you don't need to just have a try it now interactive UI for uh, for uh, for your API. You can also generate static docs that could maybe be written in PDF and that sort of thing. Other questions. Have you done anything with uh, testing, either client side or server side testing? Uh, we have done some things, but we're getting a little lazy. So I know that people have, I think Alexi here has talked to us about that uh, over IRC. So maybe you have something to share on that front of what you're doing. Uh, sure. Uh, check out the version of Fire Order. It's uh, our internal testing framework for Scala API. It's basically C CSV based testing where you provide a JSON input to an endpoint and expected output and errors. So essentially, we, so we think we should, we can add something like this to, to Swagger. The question is, essentially Swagger defines the shape of the API. It doesn't care about semantics. Uh, the assumption is that if you have an existing state, it's very hard to recreate it. But let's say in our test context, we start with pristine database. We know what we're sticking into the state and what we're getting out. So for that case, we probably should be able to define a sequence of JSON inputs and outputs. So we structure the CSV. Uh, once we have some cycles, I was thinking of basically kind of somehow merging with, with uh, Swagger as a kind of amendment to the standard saying, you know, here's how you can give inputs to these endpoints here so you can get out. So maybe you know we can do it like it as an open source project. So check out our folder and let us know what you think. Other questions? So as I mentioned also there's a play two module that, that is pretty popular. Um, there's samples in if you go to Swagger core is in GitHub. samples about how to integrate with it. So different uh, JAX RS implementation, Rails, Apache CXF. A lot of people use CXF. I didn't think it was still alive, but it is. Plane 2, Rest Easy, um, and of course all this all up. That's it for me, unless there's other questions, yeah. A general question, I continue to be impressed that you know both JavaScript and Scala, you're the only person who like, knows that <laughs> so deep depth, I, I know. Uh, can you teach us a script? Basically, I, I'm looking for a course, JavaScript or Scala developers. Yes. Uh, it's basically because, you know, it's hard to it's kind of for Scala folks to see recently JavaScript. 
So, but it's obviously useful. Uh, so I'm just wondering. You know, yeah, yeah. Here's my problem: is I'm not great at either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know of any good good way to learn those. It? It's called uh, Swagger Four. Swagger Four, and then the the other. I'm actually working to to get the documentation as good as possible on that. I have to answer a lot of questions because the thing's not being documented well. So. There's a bunch of stuff on here as far as how you integrate, what the spec actually looks like, and then um, the reasons why decisions have been made. So like, there's a, there's a newer version of the spec coming out right now, and I'm trying to make sure it's clear as to why it needs to be made so that people can understand. It's not just like a pissy match between two people and naming conventions. And so we're uh, typically in irc.freeno.net, or Swagger is the Room. And uh, if you have any other questions, send it up. Thanks.